Well, this is the fourth of our recordings from the summer garden party we held at Opera Holland Park on June the 3rd. A big crowd and a gorgeous sunbaked day in West London. And we had Leslie Ann Jones on the Stones, Bob Stanley talking about the Bee Gees, John Higgs looking back at the Beatles and James Bond. And this is our conversation with our last guest, Claire Grogan, almost exactly 40 years ago uh, since we were both at Smash Hits and we just put her on the cover for the third time. And it covers the further adventures of Altered Images, uh, the chance meeting with Bill Forsythe when she was working as a waitress in a spaghetti restaurant in Glasgow that led to Gregory's Girl, her time in Red Dwarf and its obsessive fans, uh, the 80s pop package tours, and a great story about Nick Kershaw and John Taylor. There is laughter and there are tears, and she's on her way now. We give you Claire Grogan. <laughs> You're listening to a podcast from The Word. We had a great Christmas issue, didn't we, Dave? With Claire with Christmas streamers on. Oh, the front. absolutely. Yeah. Sold like hotcakes. We're doing very well. Lovely to see you. Fantastic. Hello. Well, look, there's so much to talk to you about. And uh, one of the things that I think we wanted to start with was, was obviously with Gregory's Girl. Which is before Altered Images, and you got the job when you were, um, this sounds like a human league song, when you were working as a waitress in the Spaghetti House restaurant, where it was in, in Glasgow. Yeah. Tell us what happened there. Well, I was, yeah, I was still at school, and um, I had this part-time job, because everyone did. This was before our children just expected us to look after them financially. And um, <laughs> so I had this part-time job, and I was just... It was actually Halloween, the night that I met Bill Forsyth, and I had dressed up as a, a Latin American ballroom dancer. <laughs> I don't know why. And he came in with another director, um, and I served them, and afterwards he said, Claire, uh, no, he didn't, because I had this really, we were talking about false memory earlier, and I had this false memory that it was Bill that asked me if I wanted to be in his film. But it wasn't Bill, it was his friend asked me if I wanted to be in Bill's film. <laughs> and um, I only found that out a couple of years ago because I did a radio thing. And anyway, so anyway, I'm just taking too long to tell this story, aren't I? <laughs> I'm just like, I'm a really big oversharer and I've had two glasses of rosy wine. So I'm really looking forward to what might happen. But anyway, yeah, Bill asked me to be in his film when he met me as a waitress in a spaghetti factory. And you didn't immediately say yes, did you? No, I didn't. Because, I mean, I was quite young. And also, my mum had basically told me never, ever to hand my phone number out to strangers. A film to write. So, uh, um, so they asked me for my phone number. And I said, no, absolutely no. Um, and afterwards, Sandra Payne, who was the manager of the Spaghetti Factory, said, you know, Claire, he really is legitimately a film director and he really does want you to be in this film, so you might want to reconsider that. And, and I didn't for about two weeks. And then she said, he's been on touch with me. And, I, and then finally, we did get together. Yeah, and I, he asked me to be in his film and I said, yes. <laughs> A film you only saw quite recently, for the first time. Yeah. Um, so why didn't you watch it when it came out? I think that a lot of performers are not interested in really seeing themselves afterwards because you're so critical of what you do and you just constantly think, I could have done that so much better. And I think that for me, because... And, and also when you come, I, I don't think this is a typical Glaswegian thing, but I think this is quite a northern thing and it's a bit like nobody likes a show off. So if you took any real interest in what you were doing, it was almost like get over yourself, you know. So I think there was a touch of that going on as well, but um, not that, I mean, pre-pandemic, everything's about pre-pandemic. The British Film Institute did a big screening of Gregory's Girl and they invited me along with Gordon and Dee Hepburn and a whole bunch of the cast. And I thought this might be my last opportunity to watch it on a big screen. And also, I, I really wanted my daughter Ellie to see it. I couldn't cry. 
<laughs> anyway, I just thought, if I'm going to see this film once, I'm going to see it with my daughter. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that together, and it was a really magical night because it was interesting to me because we were in a really genuinely big auditorium that was crammed full, and I wondered about how people would respond to it in this day and age. Yeah. And, you know, people just really... I mean, that's a whole other story, really, isn't it? The, Gregory's Girl and... I mean, I love the... I always loved the role reversal thing that was going on in it, even although, to a certain extent, it was sort of subconscious for me at the time. But, you know, boys baking cakes and selling them in the toilets girls playing football. I mean, this was 1980. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not, you know, it was quite forward thinking in some levels. And in other levels, there was a lot of stuff that you might go, ooh, I'm not sure if that's okay anymore, you know? But it's, you know, it was really brilliant just to be in that room and have, hearing people's laughter, you know? That was just glorious. Well, almost immediately after that, you were, I think you were on tour with the Banshees when you were 17, and your parents let you go, even though you were at school with the band. But that whole period, Dave and I have got very fond, nostalgic memories of that from, from our time at Smash Hits. But what, what was your view of the kind of great golden era of the 80s pop? Who were, who were the bands that you got on with best, and who were the rivals, and who were the kind of people you met at Top of the Pops? And... Well, I was a ginormous big music fan. I was brought up in a household of three generations of music lovers. And I think that really, really has stayed with me throughout my life. And I mean, I, I had no idea that I was going to be a lead singer until my big sister Kathleen said she didn't want to be in the band and said, Claire might do this because the boys had already established the band. And, but none of them wanted to sing. So I became the singer by default. And I had no idea how much I wanted to be a lead singer until I was one. And then I revisited that moment in lockdown because over the years I've done a ton of stuff. I've been really lucky and I love working and feel so fortunate. <laughs> but in lockdown, the thing that I really missed was singing. And that took me by surprise. Mm. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why my album's called Mascara Streaks, and that's not as a big selling like initiative that I've devised. But yeah, I could not get over how much I miss singing. But also Mr. An audience reaction, presumably, too. Yeah, I mean my God, I am... Um, I love being clapped. <laughs> I like a big cheer. <laughs> There's something wrong with me. <laughs> there just is. But that's, that's kind of a serious point without getting kind of psychological about it. <laughs> yeah. they, always, they always say that about performers, that there's a little bit of them that, that only performing will... Yeah. Well, make up for. Is they that, they is have that holes the in their psychology that can only be filled by applause. Yeah. I mean, I was speaking to somebody just the other day about J.D. Salinger, who stopped writing. Um, well, no, he didn't stop writing. He stopped publishing books. Yes. Yeah. And he just wrote for himself. And I just thought, oh, God, that is so... There's something quite earnest and good about that. But actually... <laughs> Really and truly, do you not want people to love you <laughs> more than catch her in the rye, you know? <laughs> but maybe that's the point. Maybe there's a point where you do go, I can't, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what J.D. Salinger was thinking, but I can't imagine just, as much as my daughter Ellie will confirm that I do sing in bedrooms and bathrooms and here, there and everywhere, and... I do it for myself a lot of the time because I think it's a big, you know, it's a really big, you know, music therapy is a massive thing. I think that we really, I don't think you guys underestimate the power of music and how it makes you feel and where it lifts you and where it takes you. But to discover that really 
yourself during lockdown, it was it was quite um, it was quite extraordinary to me. So you you still perform now, obviously. Uh-huh. Uh, yep. Do you enjoy it more now than you did then? I love it. I mean, I don't know if I enjoy it more because, but what I really love is the connection that I have with an audience now because I know we've all been through a whole bunch of shit and no one's pretending anything. And yet we have this moment where we just want to forget about that and be engaged in something joyous because I think sometimes people, I mean, I, I am always going to make the most out of every situation I find myself in because why wouldn't you? But I also think that a lot of my desire to be happy has maybe come from a slightly more painful place. Mm. So I think when you've experienced a lot of extremes in life, which everyone does, it just makes you want to go, all right, we're here, there's a bar, there's a microphone, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> you've, done, you've done your share of kind of, uh, what, what you call them package tours of, you know, people, yeah. 80s hit makers. Mm-hmm. You know, and there must be people who go into that kind of enterprise with a slightly more grudging attitude. Is that, is that fair to say? Are, are you always happy to do it? And... Do you know what? I, I think that it's been an interesting thing for me because I think no matter what, I, I love opportunity. And I think that it's really important to go, if there's an audience out there, that that's the important thing and I'm not just saying that I mean I could just say that but I'm not and when I first started doing it I, it was almost like um, I think I've told you this before that it was Kim Wilde phoned me up and said come on Claire you know and, and it's like a college reunion yeah it was so, yeah, Nick Kershaw's going to be there the league yeah. are going to be there it the haircuts like, yeah. yeah yeah. I mean it is a bit like Friends Reunited yeah Will I tell you my Nick Kershaw story? Oh, no, yes, go on, please yeah. do. Right, so... Does it involve a snood? I've had to apologise to him on a few occasions about this, but um, in the... I think it was maybe about 85, I got asked to present the Best Band Award at the Brits. And, um, and in those days, you, you knew beforehand who was getting it, so it was Duran Duran. Right, so I really fancied John Taylor... So I'm like, I'm in. Yeah, I'm going. You're only human. Uh huh. So, <laughs> I mean, everyone in the planet fancy John <laughs> Taylor, don't they? Take a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you too, as well. You're on board with that. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Um, so I was like, I'm so excited about this moment. And then when we got there, just before I went on stage to present the award, they went, actually, Duran Duran are not here. Nick Kershaw is going to pick up the award. And honestly, I've got such a face on me. I'm like, <laughs> Are you joking? I, of course, I've met Nick so many times doing these, like, you know, rewind shows, and I don't know if he ever noticed how pissed off I was just like, I fucking Damn. have the award. <laughs> I was going to get engaged to John. John Taylor tonight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's so wrong. But actually, um, I, that night, Leslie and I met uh, Bill Wyman as well, so um, somebody asked me if I'd it's come. It's gone a bit quiet, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's sort of a weird, memorable night because somebody said, would you like to come and meet Bill Wyman? And I was like, okay. And then I went over there and Mandy was there and I thought, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, interesting. The, All I'm saying. The I temperature seems to have dropped a few degrees. <laughs> I think I was too lower. old. <laughs> Yeah. Am I being controversial? I'm not, well, I mean, how controversial can you get when you commit bigamy? I'm looking oh, at yeah, you. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I would point out that Claire Gregg and I are actually married in Memphis, Tennessee, at the first church of the Elvis impersonator, <laughs> which, which I don't think holds good in law, actually. Uh, well, but... I'm still waiting on my alimony. Is that the word? <laughs> 
No, it, it intrigues me, this. Because she must have rubbed shoulders with loads of those people in the 80s, I don't know, Spano Bally, Human League, all these people. Yeah. And, then, and then you kind of meet them again. You must meet them again 30 years later. Do, do people go... Yeah, what kind of conversations take place be between people in those? Well, I'll tell you the truth. I recently did a show, and it was with um, Tony Hadley and... Um, at Heaven 17 and um, Carol Decker and there was a whole bunch of us but due to the circumstances of the show we ended up like just hanging out together a bit more than we normally do and um, and we all ended up talking about our dysfunctional children. <laughs> Ellie, no offence. Okay. <laughs> Ellie's on merch. Wish you'd been there now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, so that's quite funny. Um, but, you know, I mean, just going back to that, everybody's quite... I, I mean, I remember meeting these people in the green room at Top of the Pops and just being absolutely terrified. And there's something just... We've all had this really big shared experience. It might not be your thing or, you know, it's, it's just... No matter what, I think there's something about the 80s that I keep on thinking the bubble will burst. And it hasn't. And actually, I just think the songs are really good. Maybe that's all it is. I don't know. Um, but to a certain extent, even I got to a point, I mean, I do lots of stuff, as you know, but suddenly I just thought, I really, for all those people that come to see us in those big shows, I suddenly went, thought the best thank you I can do for that because I can't tell you how how privileged I feel to still be in this situation is to write some new music whether they want to hear it or not that's a different thing because it's a bit like you know it's like this is from my new album and everyone's like oh god yeah. <laughs> but actually it did go quite well my new album so that's all been good and you've got copies of your new album here yes I do happy to <laughs> sign and so forth and buy from your family is that fair? exactly yes. so, is, do you know but the thing is when you it's like being having a like a little cottage cottage industry you know when you're in this level of it it's 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 been and doing the new album was super interesting because everything's about social media now and of course I was absolutely shit at social media but I've kind of had to learn some things and and there's been something really interesting about that. I've really enjoyed that whole whole thing. I really have. I must just briefly ask you about the Red Dwarf uh, period of your life. Yeah. Because uh, suddenly you were, you, were, you were in Red Dwarf and you were going to, to those kind of conventions that they have. And I, I think you've said in the past that, that the obsessive nature of mm. the Red Dwarf fan is, is infinitely more obsessive than that of a pop music fan. So tell us a bit about them. Well, I mean, I had been... T to a certain extent, I mean, the Red Dwarf experience really baffled me because, uh, I mean, you never do anything expecting, I mean, most, I mean, I mean I'm not just saying this because I'm a terrible show off, but a lot of the things that I've done have been really big cult things like, you know, Father Ted, Skins, but the Red Dwarf thing was like quite an unusual experience because I didn't quite understand just how crazy, why people were so crazy for it. And in fact, it was for you guys that I went to my first ever con um, convention, sci-fi con convention to write something for you. Oh, because right. eventually I thought these people... Yes, we yeah, commissioned Yeah, you did. Uh -huh. That's all come back to me. Yeah. So uh, it's like for literally every week still and this is all many many years have passed and people still talk to me about red dwarf not just you guys and um and yeah and so when this convention happened and i thought oh no this is the really funny thing so so i you know i just i mean a lot of that stuff i'll be dead honest with you is not really my kind of thing but i'm always really interested in stuff and so I'd said no 25 times, and then I said yes. And then I spoke to you two, and you said, okay, write something about it, and I did. And I went along, and I took a book with me, because I thought, <laughs> really and truly, I'm going to have eight hours in this massive convention hall with nothing really to do. 
So I took, um, I took a book with me so I could just like read while somebody would occasionally come up and say, would you sign that or whatever? And literally for eight hours, I was like this, you know. But also when I arrived, because I did get replaced in Red Dwarf, that's the other thing, by a really lovely, lovely actor called Chloe Anna, and she's a really nice woman, but I'd never met her till that point. So when I arrived at the convention, they went, we've done something really special. We're going to sit you and Chloe together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, great. <laughs> Thanks. And actually, it was actually a really lovely thing because we did have an absolute laugh. We really did. Yeah, and I, I, I signed lots and lots and lots of photos of me as Kachansky. So when you, when you look back, well, it's still going on. But, uh, you know, as, was, as Mark said at the beginning, 40 years since you were on the cover of Smash Hits. What do you look back as your, your personal highlight? Can you pick one? Or you think, that was it, that was the best thing? No, I think keeping going is the big thing. I think that's the massive thing. I feel, you know, I mean, I've had some incredible moments. You can't, um, they them being a show off again. You just can't believe them. Some, even I can't believe myself sometimes. But just the opportunity to keep going is massive to me. It really, really is because ultimately, I don't think people really know how hard it is when you're on this kind of level. And I think that, um, and that comes from being surrounded. I have a really great team of people that I work with um, who are amazing and are really into it. And, I, I, and then you guys, you, you know, you must recognize this. Yeah, just that thing of being, al I always say the word allowed and I don't know if that's the right word, but I just didn't expect that I, I would be still doing it on the level that I am. But it's because I want to, you know, and because I'm probably unemployable <laughs> in the real world. There's lots of reasons why, but yeah, just keeping going is the big thing. I just like, thank you for the job, guys. Thank you for being here, you know. That's how I feel about it. It's so all, all the images, the band still very much exists, doesn't it? Well, I mean, it does, but I mean, you were talking earlier about, you know, the legitimacy of how many, like, members of the original band and all that stuff. And I mean, that my God, that's a whole other story for me as well. Um, but in a weird way, I mean, ultimately when I perform live, I am the only original member and I have a pool of 10 amazing musicians uh, that live in Glasgow um, that work with me. And I go up to Glasgow and I rotate the band all the time, which actually keeps it really fresh and really lovely. But I think the thing for me was, there was a moment in my, because I didn't sing an Altered Images song for 18 years, because I, I just really wanted to just go, that's, that's over. And the thing that happened to me was, nobody would let it be over. Nobody would let me be over it. And eventually, I think I really came to peace with the fact that that I could refresh it in a way and, and I'll not pretend and make money out of it and have something else in my life that made people clap and cheer for me. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's hard to describe, but you know, it, it was just, as I say, it genuinely Kim Wilde phoned me up and we were, doing, she was, we were doing an arena tour with the Human League and, and, and Kim, and she said, come on. And I just, I kind of thought, why not? And I was probably going through quite a difficult period in my life at that point. And, um, and I just thought maybe, and that's when I also really engaged with the notion that singing was a lot, was a, a very therapeutic thing for me, you know? Um, and that was, and, and you know, I had this really, I always like, I love this film called, um, how to Murder Your Wife, it's a Jack Lemmon film, and his, he meets his wife because she jumps out of a birthday cake. Yes. So I thought, oh God, if I do this tour, maybe I can jump out of a birthday cake. <laughs> and that's what I did. So I had this amazing cake designed and made for me. And I remember uh, our first show was in Newcastle Arena, right? 
So I'm sitting inside this big stupid cake, right? It's so beautiful though. And I do, I have tears streaming down my eyes because I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> you know? And the intro to my part of the show is like the intro to Happy Birthday. And I get wheeled out into, onto stage and I could just hear the whole audience singing Happy Birthday. And I thought, I'm going to be all right. Yeah. Well, any, I don't even any need followers to sing. of yours on, on Twitter will, will be used to your fantastic clips of <laughs> unbelievable exuberance before oh. and, and after coming off stage, you know. Oh, it's been so nice to talk to you. It's funny that, that uh, I was just looking at that interview that we yeah. did with you exactly 40 years ago, and you're, you're saying that um, the biggest problem with life is that you've been inundated with TV and film offers. Yeah. Uh, and also various musical opportunities mm. because the group have had so much success, you know. And uh, we're so glad that happened and, uh, and that it worked out like it did. Very nice to talk to you. Fantastic. Thank Thanks you for so much. Very good. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. And- 